Welcome to our Brazil International Talk Show. I'm Suzanne Thorson, and we are a team of Brazilian and Hispanic entrepreneurs who live in Florida and contribute to the development of South Florida's community and economy. Our goal is to discuss subjects of interest between the Brazilian Hispanic communities and generate partnerships between, here within the United States. Our subject today is education. I invite the hosts to discuss obstacles that they incurred uh, due to foreign-based education. For example, American business writing is very short and precise, while Latins tend to provide excessive details, right, uh, when they communicate. Also, the sentence structure is different. That just to mention some. So uh, can you share also with us like difficulties that you had when you first moved to the United States? Yeah, I think... Uh, Dr. Carlos Barroso, please. Yeah, I think, you know, when I came, and I came when I was very young to the United States, but what I see, I was two years old, but what I see from a lot of um, international students, right, no matter where they're coming from, is uh, one, the language barriers, you've got cultural barriers, you even have sense of time, punctuality. Here in the United States, things are much more punctual. So there's certain challenges that uh, international uh, folks come coming into the United States face uh, day to day and, and in terms of education. Exactly, it's true. Any Anyone also like Aloysio, Roberto, like did you have like things that were hard to overcome or well no, so no, I, 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 no? I, I was you know fluent in english uh because i was an exchange student in california in 1960 so that's where I really i i, I learned english and, and that became key to my career uh in in the bank Okay, thank you so much. In fact, you know, I think that education is very important when you move to a different uh, country because uh, always we have to adapt and learn skills and uh, to better really be able to compete in the market. So we are honored to present our very special subject expert, Dr. Michael Horswell. Dean of the Dorothy F. Smith College of Arts and Letters of the Florida Atlantic University. We'd like to discuss how the college can direct and efficiently contribute to the effort of turning South Florida into a well-recognized hub of international knowledge. Dr. Michael Horswell, welcome to our show. Boa tarde to everyone and good afternoon. Uh, Suzanne, it's wonderful to be with you again. Uh, thank you for this invitation. And it's a real honor to be with all this, uh, this panel this afternoon of uh, experts in their own ways in, in international business and, interna and international education. Um, and so, and culture and art as uh, Suzanne represents, of course. So I am, as introduced, uh, the Dean of the Dorothy F. Schmidt College of Arts and Letters at Florida Atlantic University here in Boca Raton. And I, I want to talk a little bit about how our university and, and spe especially the College of Arts and Letters is approaching uh, international education and how we can be a real partner to the Brazilian community and other uh, Latin community partners here in South Florida to make sure that we are we do become that hub of international relations, international business. Um, this is dear to my heart. I uh, was uh, born in South Carolina in the United States. Uh, most of my life had no exposure to 
international cultures until high school in which I started taking Spanish classes. And so through the Spanish language and eventually when I got to college, I continued to sp study Spanish at the college level. Um, I was really, it really opened my uh, worldview to, to the world, literally. And then I was fortunate enough, um, like Roberto, to study in another country and do an exchange program studying in Spain, in my case, and which really, again, opened me up to, to the whole world. And so from then on, my career really had be has become a very internationally oriented career. Uh, I ended up having a Rotary Foundation fellowship to study in Argentina. So I was in Buenos Aires for a year and really was able to uh, learn so much about the, uh, the South American economy. Um, I studied economics, uh, came back, worked in banking as Olicio and Roberto did. Um, and so I enjoyed the international banking uh, community before going back to get a PhD in Latin American studies. And so that brought me to, into the professorship of Latin American studies and eventually to FAU where I eventually became the Dean of the College of Arts and Letters. So international studies is so, so important. And I wanna share with you some of the things we're doing at, um, at FAU. So I'm just going to share right now my screen and hopefully you can see the, uh, my presentation. Yes? Yes. Is that visible? And I'm gonna just make sure that the slide yeah. Exactly. It's okay. very good. Uh -huh. Excellent. So for the viewers who may not know Florida Atlantic University, we're uh, a, a top public university in the country. We're in, on the road to being a top 100 public university. You know, the United States has literally thousands of universities. And so to be in this top group, we're ranked 136 right now, is quite an honor. And we're improving every year. And I think in the next five years, we'll be in the top 100. Um, and we have 30,000 students. We're very comprehensive. We have colleges of business. We have a college of medicine. We have a college of science, a college of computer science and engineering. Um, and of course, arts and letters, uh, my college is the college where you would find the social sciences, the humanities, a school of communication, a school of architecture, um, as well as a school of public administration. And we have both bachelor's degrees as well as master's degrees in all of these areas you see on the screen. And we have two PhD programs, one in uh, the humanities and social sciences and another PhD in the School of Public Administration. Um, so we're very proud of the work our faculty, our, our faculty come from the best universities in the world and they come here to teach students and they do a fabulous job working with uh, the students who come to FAU. We also provide services to the business community here. Um, for example, uh, uh, Dr. Carlos Barroso just mentioned some of the barriers around language and culture that happens when, a, when an adult moves to a new country and has to learn the language or perfect their language that they already have. And so we have a service we call Owl Lingua. So I should say FAU, uh, our mascot, you know, every university in the United States has a mascot. Ours are the fighting owls, the owls. And we have actually owls on campus, uh, little owls that live all around the campus. But our, our company, Owl Lingua, is um, a really a, a language service here to the community. This is really not just for our students. This is for any company or business who needs to learn, uh, have their employees learn a language or perfect English. Um, and of course, we're also teaching many other languages such as Portuguese. Uh, we also do translation services and other custom services for businesses. Um, we also really wanna be the place that trains students for all kinds of international careers, not just in business, but also, for example, in politics and international relations. We have a, a special diplomacy program that trains our students to, to go into those careers. And um, our program also competes at the, the United Nations every year, and we win the competition frequently. This past year, we were the top finishing university of all of the United States um, because our students get such great training on this kind of international relations and international careers, um, especially um, in our sci political science department. But actually, you don't have to be a political science major to participate in this diplomacy program. You could come with any major uh, because we know diplomats come actually from all different backgrounds. Um, we also have another pro program that I think is interesting to your viewers, and that is the Study of the Americas Initiative. And this is really, we have literally dozens of professors who specialize on Latin America, 
North America, the United States, Canada, and of course the Caribbean, which is right here in our backyard. Boca Raton is at this unique nexus between North and South. And we wanna be uh, a real academic powerhouse on uh, the study of these countries and the study of these cultures and societies. Um, we um, also work already closely with the Brazilian, uh, Brazilian Business Group and the Brazilian International Foundation, uh, thanks to Aluso's introductions. Um, and we've, for five years, hosted the Brazil-Florida Summit. And so to answer your question, how can we do more to really support the community? These kind of academic summits where experts come from Brazil and they come from FAU to talk about the latest trends in the country that go beyond just the business side. You know, it's, it gets into the culture, into the politics, into the history. And so this just this past November, we had our fifth summit. This year it had to be, uh, because of COVID, had to be uh, virtual. Um, but we, you can see the, the names there, the professors who talked from their perspective on Brazil. These are our FAU professors talking about Brazil. And you're going to see more and more of that as, as we grow the, the number of professors who specialize on Brazil. Uh, we also have a very wonderful relationship, again, thanks to uh, Aloysio, um, with the Universidade Federal Fluminense in, in near Rio de Janeiro. We're very excited about this partnership. Um, it's primarily for now in the Instituto de Estudos Estratégicos, which is um, really a, a international relations. And so that we've already brought Brazilian experts to our campus and we've sent FAU professors to their campus. And one day we hope to have an exchange program with so students can start going back and forth uh, between the countries to study the United States or study Brazil. Um, as you know, uh, Suzanne, you know this better than anyone in the room, the creative economy is something sometimes we forget about. You know, we, we think about building, you know, you know, factories and 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 you know and and building airplanes and things like that as the economy. But the, but we know that there's a huge industry in what we call arts and culture industries. So in the United States, this this number is a couple of years old. It's usually it's an almost eight hundred billion dollar industry. It's four point two percent of our gross domestic product. And when you think of an economy the size of the United States, that's a lot of jobs, a lot of opportunities, a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities. And so the arts is something we should not overlook. And my college is blessed with wonderful arts programs, training students to go into the creative industries. Just here in the state of Florida, you can look at the, da the data. It's a $3.1 billion impact. This is just what we call arts and culture uh, sector of the economy in Florida. Right more close to home, Palm Beach County, you can see the number of jobs, 15,000 jobs just in art and culture, very narrowly defined, lots of opportunities. Um, and of course, uh, I can't stop, I can't finish this presentation without talking about Brazilian Beat as an example of you know, the opportunities in the arts. And so Suzanne's wonderful company created a spectacular experience for my college as a fundraising activity uh, back in February of 2020. It literally was the last event before we got closed down for COVID. Um, it was a beautiful event. This is just a one photograph of the beautiful costumed uh, entertainers that, that Suzanne brought to the, to the university. And we had a, a wonderful fundraiser. We raised over $125,000 for scholarships for students and all the money went straight to scholarships. So uh, thank you, Suzanne, again, for all that beautiful work you did. Thank you. Um, you know, continuing in the arts, we have our own uh, record label here at FAU, and we have uh, most of our professors are actually Latin-oriented professors you know, they're from their background. So we've we've been nominated for Latin Grammy Awards from the productions out of coming out of our commercial music program. So this so students who want to do not just the performance side of music, but want to do the engineering of albums, uh, be a producer. Uh, we're producing amazing students that are already out at, you know, working at Sony and, you know, the big companies um, creating uh, music for, for the world. And I think we all know from COVID, what did we do every night during COVID? We went home and we probably watched movies, listened to music, read books, read novels. Uh, we entertained ourselves, right? Well, those are cultural products, uh, part of the economy. And I know that our college arts and, of Arts and Letters are, is preparing the students for that. And we have so many international students who are participating in this. And I think we'll talk about, about a little bit later about those numbers. Um, I, I can't, st can't finish without talking about our architecture school. 
I think this is super interesting. And we have architects, they're international architects. All of them are pretty much from another country uh, other than the United States. Um, but their specialty is on adaptation to climate change. And so they're preparing students to build the cities of the future, um, taking into consideration things like a sea level rise and other adaptation issues we're gonna have. This is just a quick photo of a, uh, of what a project in Florida. Uh, if you live below Sample Road, I hate to tell you, but in a hundred years, it's gonna be underwater. So we are already designing the cities of the future in South Florida to adapt and uh, to that, that low sea level rise. Um, you have another pre great project related to Latin America. We just earned a National uh, Endowment for Humanities grant to, to digitize uh, an amazing photography collection. We have, it's a Latin American collection. It's the, all the hundreds, thousands of photos and taken in all the countries of Latin America, including Brazil, uh, hundreds of photos in Brazil and other countries. Um, and this, these photos were taken, you know, basically starting in the 50s. And so they really document Latin America from a very unique perspective. And they're here in our collection at FAU. So this grant is allowing those photographs to be digitized so they'll be accessible to the whole world. And I, so it's, a, it's an ex, just an exciting example of how we're connecting to Latin America and our, and our college. And then finally, we have a new institute uh, called the Brain Institute FAU. They've partnered with one of my philosopher prof philosophy professors and she's created, uh, Susan Schneider has cre created the Center for the Future Mind. And this is a center, very cutting edge center that's thinking about artificial intelligence and the future of our minds. Because I bet all of us in the room and everyone watching has one of these. This is almost like the extension of our minds today. We don't know what that really is what kind of effects it's having on our consciousness, on our brain. And of course, we know that soon things are gonna be implanted in our brain to enhance our brain power. It sounds like science fiction, but it's happening now. So this new center in my college is gonna be studying that. Our, how artificial intelligence will join with human beings. And I think it's the next big business sector as well, is how artificial intelligence will be um, interacting it through business. So it's an exciting place for students to come study uh, on that. And then, and then finally, our college has a special relationship to uh, what I might call the, the Jewish community, the Jewish history. We have a Jewish uh, studies program and a human rights program related to the Holocaust. Um, and so this, this is a center that students can get involved in. Uh, we also educate all the second, uh, second secondary schools teachers in the region on how to teach issues of Holocaust. And of course, this is international. This is, uh, we, we just did a program Holocaust in Latin America uh, last year. Um, and so this is another way that we're, we're really preparing students for the international. And I'll close just by saying that I, I, I mentioned these things, uh, these, these, a lot of his hum, humanities oriented um, programs that we have in the College of Arts and Letters, because I think whether you're doing business or you're doing international relations, if you don't have kind of a cultural competence to talk to your counterpart, it, you're not gonna go far in business. And, and it goes back to something um, Carlos said, Dr. Barroso said earlier about, you know, you know, when you come to another country, you have to learn those new ways of, of, of interacting. And I learned right away in Latin America, if you start trying to do business on, on minute number one of the meeting, you're going to fail. You have to develop the relationship first. And how do you develop the relationship? So Aloysio and I have breakfast, on, you know, a couple of times a semester. We don't talk about business until the end. We talk about interesting things, history, literature, uh, film, uh, his background, his, you know, his, which is fascinating. Um, you know, we talk about all those things. And so if a student isn't prepared, if they know nothing about Brazil, how are they going to do business? They could be perfect at the business side of things, but if they don't have any kind of cultural knowledge behind it, I think it's going to be difficult for their careers. So I would like to say that the College of Arts and Letters is a place where every student should take at least a few courses if they want to learn more about the world, whether it's Latin America or other parts of the world, so they can really be fluent in that cultural competence when they go out to do business or international relations or engineering or whatever they're going to be doing. So that's the end of my presentation. I look forward to talking with you now. 
Thank you so much, Michael. How interesting your presentation. We really like, thank you so much. I, I agree with you that culture, arts, you know, like cross borders and that's like really something that eases conversations and prepare like, you know, as you said, for business. And uh, we want to thank you especially because uh, with this partnership with the Brazil International Foundation, so many things came. I remember the Festival of Brazilian Movies, right? Uh, films and uh, dance and music. You always have your doors open. And thank you so much. I really think that it's crucial for our uh, better adaptation into the, the American culture. So uh, we will, let's now begin the Q&A. Taking the lead, Mr. Aloysio Vasconcelos, it's you. <laughs> Please, you I started, started all. all. No, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know what you were going to say. And uh, I, was I, I was trying to volunteer to say that uh, in the screen today, we have three generations. I am the oldest, of course. When I went to, to, to the American Graduate School of International Management, the Tandemburg, that you all know, <laughs> we are, uh, first of all, I was a lawyer in Brazil, a young lawyer, and I started, uh, I decided to, I decided that the, the world was going to internationalize, and the only school that existed practically fully specialized at that time was Tandemburg, so I went there. And later on, I, 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 and then when I, only in the 80s, at Citibank, the, the, this subject was discussed so openly. Uh, Michael at one time mentioned to me that you, you, you considered Thunderbird sometime in the past. Yes, it, it's one of the best businesses uh, in the country. For the country. Yeah, at that time. And now we have Carlos, whom I saw when he, he was uh, six or seven years old, but he also went to Thunderbird. And, uh, uh, and then later on, of course, he got his uh, PhD. And so we have three generations of uh, internationalists, if you can say that. And uh, now they have different names. But uh, I just want to point out that I think it's important because it shows that things are coming steady and fast. And that's always, always you like you know, um, my kids, our kids, and you. You have even grandchildren here, so that those are already Americans with Brazilian background. So, like my daughter is fluent in Portuguese and English. And uh, by the way, she studied in St. Andrew's School from JK to fifth grade. And I realized how many Brazilians have been arriving on the last two, three years, right, Dr. Carlos? Yeah, that's right. Uh, there's so many Brazilians coming to this area. And Dean Horsell, thank you so much for your presentation. It was quite insightful. You had some great uh, information there about FAU. And a hey, full disclosure, I'm a big fan of FAU. My wife graduated from Florida Atlantic University. She has a successful mental health practice and is practicing telemedicine right now. And uh, she's a proud FAU alum. And yes, I, I attended Thunderbird as well, just like Aloysio. So proud Thunderbird uh, alum. So my question to you today, I I'm a fellow educator, right? I I'm here in Boca Raton albeit at the pre-K through 12 level. And here at St. Andrew's School, we're just 10 minutes away from FAU. Um, back when we started in 1962, we were a fully just an all boys boarding school and our first 122 students included a student from Brazil as an international student. And since then, international students have been a very important part of the fabric of St. Andrew's School in our boarding program. So I, I'm sure that you feel like that um, that same benefit to FAU of having international students on campus. So my question is this, given the pandemic and all the challenges, right, that that pandemic brings, how has FAU maintained that international recruitment funnel for international students? Right, uh, Carlos, first of all, congratulations. Uh, for the viewers, uh, St. Andrew's School is if not the premier, probably, I think it is the premier school when I think of our wonderful K through 12 
uh, uh, private schools here in South Florida, and and really one of the premier in the in the whole nation. And I'm very blessed to say many. So we have several graduates from my field of, of Spanish and Latin American studies who teach uh, now at your school, and um, they they rave about this the the, fac the the faculty and the students there. It's a really unique experience, and I, I think anyone that can can send their child there would be really, really fortunate. It's a great school. And I hope we can, you know, do some partnerships. Uh, we, we do a few things through the languages department with your languages department, but I'm sure we could do more. Um, so yes, it's been so challenging ever since basically this time last year, I think it was March 15th when FA, FAU had to close all of their in-person operation, just like pretty much everywhere in the world. Um, and we had a lot of international students on campus and we had some, it happened to be our spring break. So we had some that had gone home. So you can imagine the challenges uh, to, and, and uh, we had, I, I have the number here for you. I think we had 80, yeah, we had 82 Brazilian students last spring. Um, and some of them got caught up in this. And so they, so what we did was we went online, basically like most of the world, and that we finished out that fall semester, I'm sorry, spring semester completely online. So the students, the international students who had gone back home, they were able to continue and complete their semester. Um, and then we ended up building for summer and and, the, and then this past fall, um, basically a very robust online uh, a curriculum for the students who could not come back to campus. And that included a lot of international, including some Brazilian students. Um, so we we continued also to you know try to service them in the sense that uh, we would help them with their visas. There were a lot of challenges with visas, et cetera, for those international students. But we were able to continue to do that, and the students have continued to either take their courses virtually, or, you know, online, or some actually did get back in the country for the fall semester. And of course, we have our dorms are open, our residence halls are open, and we're taking all the COVID precautions. Um, I'm happy to say, and I I, I say that. I, I, I shouldn't say it, I'm gonna knock on wood as we say in the United States, um, but we have had no uh, COVID transmissions in the classrooms at FAU. We're, we're tracing very carefully. We've had a few cases in, you know, in, of students with COVID, but thank God so far nothing um, uh, too serious and, uh, and really not too much spread. So we've been really fortunate um, and on our campus um, to have just a very few cases on our, in our staff and our, and, our, and our student body. So we're feeling pretty good. We almost to see the light at the end of the tunnel. And we, as soon as, um, you know, thing, the vaccination gets out to the world, I think we'll be able to bring international students back uh, really quickly. Um, I think also with a change in, in focus at the national level and the government and the way visas, et cetera, are gonna be handled in the next government that we have now, um, I think we'll see it'll be easier, hopefully for international students to come. Brazil right now is our number one uh, group of international students. It used to be number three or four behind China and India, but because of the last three or four years with visa issues and then COVID, um, those countries have, have dropped down in FAU's ranking of number of international students. I'm sure it will come back, um, but we would love to welcome more Brazilian students to FAU. Awesome. Yeah, it has been really challenging times. You're right. And I do remember that after the fundraiser on February 2020, right after we had to cancel all our events through October. No, it's crazy. But, you know, I think that the education institutes have been really very successful with online platforms and everything. And uh, my, uh, Dr. Michael, you just uh, mentioned that it's around, I think, 82 students, right? That Brazilian students that you would have Brazilians on your institute. Um, how, um, like, we, we know how relevant Brazil is uh, to the state of Florida. I mean, internationally and culturally, like, you know, our participation has been Latins in South Florida has been really, you know, present. How does that apply to FAU in the meaning, like how relevant to FAU are the partnerships with Brazilian organizations and the projects that have been developed? Like how, like, can you like walk us through like this 
presence, Brazilian presence in South Florida? Yes. So those 82 students are the ones that had visas. So we know they're from Brazil, right? But just imagine all the second generation students who don't necessarily self, because our, our records are self-identifying when they're um, considered, you know, when they're U.S. citizens or residents. So we, I know we have way more <laughs> Brazilian heritage students on campus that just are not showing up in those official numbers because of, you know, because like I said, those 82 are the ones that actually have international student visas, right? Um, but no, uh, your question is, is spot on. I think the partnerships are so important because just, just the things that we're being able to do now with the International Brazilian Foundation just in the last few years uh, through Aloysio is an example of how a university can partner, or I would imagine a school like um, St. Andrews can partner with uh, you know, business groups, other kind of cultural groups, to achieve common purposes. So for example, this new relationship with the university in, in Rio is, is, is working both ways. It's mutually beneficial because it's uh, helping them meet their goals uh, in the area of international relations and international studies, and it's helping us meet our goals too. Um, we can't do it without them, and they probably will have a, I mean, they might be able to find another university. We could fi find another university in Brazil. But having this partnership that was bro brokered by um, Aloysio, who is right here in our community, he serves on the board of advisors of my college. So, you know, we're good friends, and he's an amazing supporter. He has brought other folks to us, th for example, through that wonderful um, party we had that you hosted. Um, the, the fundraiser, you know, we got to meet more Brazilian uh, entrepreneurs and business folks, and that can only just grow what we can do for students. Because for us, it's all about the student, right? We want to provide these opportunities for the next generation um, to get the kind of education they need in a, in a more global world. Um, and I think with COVID, one thing has taught us is we're all interconnected. Um, that, you know, they're really the idea of, of frontiers or, or, or borders is really something we've all constructed, right? Um, but th things like viruses do not know borders. And so I think we do have to start thinking the world without border, you know, with fewer borders. And these kinds of programs that we're building uh, will help our students navigate that, that new world of the future. Exactly. I, I imagine that Mr. Aloysio Vasconcelos have a question also, right, Aloysio? You're... You're... Uh, actually, it's about the, our cooperation, but a, a lot of what uh, I had to ask is already has been answered. But uh, the cooperation with FAU has been one of our goals. It turned reality about four to five years ago through cultural, educational, business, and civic events organized with success. The annual Brazilian Summit as you mentioned before, it uh, was one of the highlights of our relationship. But uh, we feel that more can be done, mainly in the arts and letters uh, side. Uh, my question is, may you suggest us other fields of interest that can enhance our activities so we can grow a little bit more in our relationships and uh, be more, more active? Yes, and I, I need to I need to brag a little bit because uh, we actually received this the Focus Brazil Award at FAU thanks to Alicia's uh, uh, advocacy I think, um, and so we're very proud of I don't know if you can see this but we're very proud of this award and so FAU is certainly wanting to do more um, with Brazil. Uh, you know you are the largest trading partner of Florida. Uh, I think you know those statistics. I won't and um, and that means. Uh, people also are, are exchanged. It's not just products exchanging, it's people. And that's what our college is all about, is, is people, the culture, society, you know, um, the arts. And so I think we can do more um, in those areas of just doing collaborative projects together that lead to um, deeper relationships between the universities in the, in the, in between Brazil and FAU so that the research can be exchanged it's so important for academics to share their research. Um, and then also that we can, have, I would love to see an exchange program where our students are going to live in Brazil for a period 
and and coming back right and and then also we love to host brazilian students for time a period of time on campus so they can do their studies in their different areas so i think student exchange is something i would love to see happen um and we've set the groundwork for that but i think there's more we can do wow uh, dr carlos barroso is there anything else you would like to ask our dean or comment or yeah dean uh, i would say with the pandemic as well has accelerated how education is delivered, right? So there's been a lot of innovations. Maybe you can touch upon just one or, one or the two different, you know, um, advances in pedagogy, right? In terms of how have things changed now in the classroom that's affecting Brazilian students? That's a great question. And I imagine your schools had to adapt <laughs> as well. Um, so it, it's just really accelerated everything as far as for example, within a few weeks, our professors, within a week, really, our professor had to go 100% online back in, in, in March. And so that necessitated a lot of training on new ways of, of teaching in these, basically these Zoom room kind of spa spaces. Um, but there, but, and what our faculty ended up doing when we, we invested very heavily um, in giving them the training and the resources they needed to learn these new techs, te techniques and in, in teaching. Um, and so what I predict is what's going to happen is, you know, we're going to go back face to face, you know, for the most part. I mean, I think everyone agrees that we miss having that that human interaction face to face. But now we have expertise on all these kind of teaching tools that you can still use. And I, I bet you're shaking your head. So I bet it's the exact same thing in your school. These teaching tools for like um, outside of the classroom activity that can really keep students learning and engaging with each other. Um, outside of the classroom period. And so when you're in the class, then you can use the classroom time for more uh, valuable experience, you know, that really where the professor really is key and the, and the knowledge that the students are creating. Because nowadays, you know, in higher education, I, I think it's the same in, the, in good schools like St. Andrews, it's the, the old professor on the stage just talking is sort of not the way it is anymore. Um, we've recognized now that students have a lot to bring to the table, a lot of knowledge and experience, especially in international kind of topics. Can you just imagine FAU? I love teaching here because I walk in to talk about Latin American history or literature, and I have really usually a student from every country of Latin America sitting in the room, right? And so they bring that knowledge. So it's it's this kind of new way of teaching in which you 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 bring all that knowledge to bear on the subject. And you you get a much better product, a much better result. So the technology that we're using to get through the COVID crisis is technology that's really going to help us continue that kind of distributed learning. There are different words for it, um, and and so that that we, the students can continue to engage much more deeply, so, frankly, than when they sat in a traditional classroom. So we're very excited about that at FAU um, uh, to continue to invest in those technologies. And, and see how it goes uh, in the future. Yeah, great. So thank you again. Uh, it was a pleasure having you with us. And we will be back always on the first Thursday of the month at 2 p.m., bringing a subject of interest to our international community here communities. It's more than one, right? Not only Brazilian, but Hispanic, and like there is a lot of countries here and uh, to, to South Florida. So thank you. And all I just wanted to uh, you to note that uh, the recording of this show will always be accessible, accessible by YouTube and also by Boca R R Tribune TV platforms. Uh, YouTube, it's uh, youtube.com slash user slash Boca Raton News TV. So we will write at the end of the show, like it's there, so you can see where you will be able to access this recording, like, you know, the show, like now is live, but after you will be able to see. And thank you all of you again. It has been a pleasure. Thank you, Suzanne. Thank you, uh, Carlos and, and, and Alicia. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks.